Dear Almighty Heavenly Father, we humbly approach thy throne in prayer, dear Lord, in thy great matchless name. Dear Lord, we thank you for all the many blessings you've bestowed upon us on this earth. And we thank you for the beautiful changing of the seasons that we have, the rain that we receive. Dear Lord, all the food that we have to eat, the water that we have to drink, and the air that we have to breathe, and we know that all these many blessings come from you, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we thank you for your Son and our Savior and the plan of salvation that we have, dear Lord, and we pray that you would give to us wisdom, bestow upon us wisdom, as we study a portion of thy word this morning. We pray that you would be with Brother Adams and help him boldly proclaim your word, we pray that you would bestow that boldness upon all of us so that we might live by the words that we hear today, but also go out and teach and preach to others as, as we should, dear Lord. Dear Lord, give us strength. Give us peace, and dear Lord, please forgive us of our sins as we repent of them, dear Lord. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to worship in thy name, dear Lord, and be with all of us here, and be with Christians everywhere, especially those laboring in difficult physical places, dear Lord. Please strengthen them and watch over and care for them as only you can. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So let's stand down here for this part of our service today. I'd like to be a little closer to you and uh, try, if you can, to ignore that chart up there <laughs> until we get ready to start the next hour. It's a real pleasure to be in meeting with you and to begin my part of this gospel meeting. I look forward to it ever since the plans were made for it. It's always a pleasure to be with Stan and Carla. I've known them right a good while. <laughs> And uh, it's always, always good to be together. We always have a good time together. But we're not here just to have a good time. That's not the purpose of this. It's certainly a pleasure to be with Stan and Becky Schultz this week as well. You know, Stan all of his life, and uh, his father and my father were elders together in the congregation in Virginia many years ago. And it's, it's a real treat to have the opportunity to be with them again for a little while, at least. We, uh, I want to talk with you at this hour about the fact that God has spoken. But there's, there's a question that comes to my hand, and that is, are you listening? In the first chapter of Hebrews, and the first couple of verses, the writer said, God, who had sundry times in divers manners, spake in time past to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, who he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the work. In the first verse of that, he, he makes the declaration that God has spoken. God spoke to the fathers in time past, the Jewish leaders or fathers, by prophets. God spoke, he said, in many different ways, diverse manners and diverse manners. He spoke sometimes in dreams. Sometimes he spoke directly to the ones that he had some message for. But he spoke also through the prophets. You remember the prophet Jeremiah said one time when God called him to be a prophet, he said, I, he said, I don't know what to say. I wouldn't know what, I wouldn't know what, what to say to to be a prophet. He said, I'm just a little child. And God said, don't say I'm a child. He said, I will, I will put my words in your mouth. And he said, he touched my mouth. He said, I will put my words in your mouth. That's what a prophet was. He was a man who had God's word in his mouth. And so God has spoken in different ways. But no passage better deals with this question that we're talk, talking about today in the eighth chapter of Luke. You want to turn your Bibles there. We're going to talk about the parable of the sower, actually. Now, this parable of the sower is recorded by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mark comments about it in verse chapter 4, verse 13 of his gospel. If you don't understand this parable, how will you understand all of the terms? He sort of makes it a key to unlocking the study of parables. And that's the reason I want to talk to you about this parable this morning. In the, let's, I've, I've chosen to read Luke's account of it in the 8th chapter of Luke, and it starts with verse 4. Let, let's, read, let's read it together here now. It said, When many people 
were gathered together and were come to, to him out of every city. He spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell to the wayside. And it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured. Some fell upon a rock. And as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Some fell on thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. Some fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He emphasizes that point again down in verse uh, in verse 18, he said, he that, Take heed therefore how you hear. Again in verse 21, he said, These, This is my mother and my brethren. They are those who hear the word of God and do it. When he talked to them in parables, the disciples came to him later on. Uh, Mark's account says that some of those who were with him with, with the twelve, that would, which would mean some of the other disciples beside the twelve, asked him later, they said, what, what is this parable? What, what is that? Why, why, why are you speaking in parables? And what, 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 is it, what does this parable mean? And so we need to talk about that. What does it mean? What is a parable? Let's talk about parables first of all. Who, who can give me a definition of a parable? What is a parable? Yeah. It's, a, it's a simple story that everyone can understand to illustrate a, probably a more uh, difficult concept, spiritual concept. A very simple definition is it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's a, it's a commonplace uh, occurrence from life. It takes a little slice of life, something that's typical of real life, and he makes a, uh, he, he, he makes a spiritual application out of that, he teaches a spiritual lesson. Thing. Now, the parable is different from a fable. In a fable, the actors in the fable do things that are not natural, that are, that is, that are not normal to real life situation. There, there was a, one, one of the, uh, in the Old Testament, in the case of the fable, where the trees had a conference to see who's going to get to be the ruler over them. Well, you know, and I do too, the trees don't have meetings and talk to each other. But in the fable, they, they do things that are unnatural to real life. But in a parable, the situations that you have in a parable are typical of real life. That, that's something that goes on in life. That's life. And so, uh, when Jesus talked in parables, he, he had a purpose for that. In fact, he went on to explain to them why he was doing that before he explained the parable itself. He said to them down in verse 10, unto you. They said, why? What, what's this parable? What, what might this parable be? Verse 10, he said, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Let's talk about that a little bit now. He said, I have spoken in parables so that you might understand. He said, uh, you'll see and you'll understand. So that's one of the, one of the purposes of parables was to reveal truth, to make it known. And to make it known in very simple, understandable terms. But he said to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. What's that about? What's Jesus saying here, he's quoting? It's not a man to reveal and conceal. Sir? Parable was meant to reveal and conceal. All right, it concealed truth. Why would he want to conceal it? Today? You know what the parable did? The parable drew a line between those who were spiritually concerned and attuned and those who were spiritually disinterested. The parable drew that line. The person who was spiritually concerned was curious about what it meant. He pried into it. He asked questions about it. They said, what does this parable mean? He said, to you, to you, you've asked about this. To you, it's given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But here are other people, and they hear the parable, and it just goes in one ear, and out the other, they don't pay attention to it. 
They're not in, they're not curious enough to even ask, what, what's this about? Well, how's that, what's that mean for me? So the parable then drew that line, sharp and clear, between the spirits of concern and the spirits of the unconcerned. This is the same reason, I believe, that uh, we have what's called apocalyptic literature in the Bible. Uh, you have, that, what, what's that anyhow? It's a very long word. What does it mean? Things that are written in sign language, signs and symbols. The book of Daniel has many, many symbols like that. Zechariah, Ezekiel, these Old Testament prophets. But the book of Revelation, the first two verses of that tell us it's in sign language. He said, he signified these things to his servant John. The signify means to reveal it in signs and symbols. Sometimes in times of crisis, such as they had oftentimes in the days of Daniel, Ezekiel, got down to captivity. God revealed truths to his people through, through this type of literature, this type of language, to give them encouragement and hope. But should it fall into the hands of their enemies, who were already of a mind to persecute them, they wouldn't understand it, so that it wouldn't enhance or add to the persecution. The book of Revelation is the same way. So there was a reason that the Lord drew a line between the spirits of the interest and the spirits of the disinterest. That was the third purpose for the parable, though, and that was to congeal the truth. It was to reveal it, to conceal it, and to congeal it. That is, to give it a permanent form or shape. Uh, when, when you think about the parable of the Good Samaritan, what is the lesson of that, just in a nutshell? Who is my brother? Neighbor. Neighbor. Remember Jesus, the lawyer that came and asked Jesus what, what he had to do and to inherit eternal life, and he told him, well, you, you're a lawyer, you know what, what does the law say? Well, that kind of put him on the spot. It made it look like he'd asked a question he already knew the answer to. It never raised, never raised a question about his motive. Why would he be asking this? Well, he said, yes, but uh, he said, well, that the law, the law said to love the Lord with all your heart, to love your neighbor as yourself. But he willing to justify himself said, and who is my neighbor? Now, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, what was the lesson of it? <laughs> Who was your neighbor? Here's my neighbor. Who was neighbor to him that fell along the thieves? Was it the priest that passed by on the other side of the Levite? They both passed by and the other man. But here was a Samaritan who came and he went to his side, helped him, paid the bill for him. Said, if it costs any more, when I come back through here, I'll take care of that. <clears throat> that stuff his wounds. And so Jesus said, Who was which one was neighbor? to the man who fell among thieves. Every time you think about that parable, you get that point, don't you? It makes you think about it. Some of, our, some of us have had a few debates down through the years. I haven't had as many as some other, some other men my age or a little younger have had. But there are incidents that occur in religious debates that are humorous. And they, they, but they make a point. And every time when preachers get together, they, they relate some of these stories to one another, you know, and talk about it. Uh, but, but, the, but some incident that happened is, that's humorous, and, and every, every time you think about that, you get the point that's involved. One, one time, Brother Curtis Porter was having a debate with the Primitive Baptist, and they were debating about predestination. And this man made the speech, and he said, God, before the world began, before he ever spun the stars in the world, he predetermined that we would have this discussion here tonight. That I would be here, Mr. Porter would be here. And he said, he, and, he, and he had what he thought was an unanswerable argument. He had a nice red apple. He had it, I held it up for the audience to see. He said, God determined before the world began that I would eat this nice red apple here tonight before this very audience. And he went on and made said, and he said, no power in heaven or earth can prevent that because that's an immutable decree of God. But he made a mistake. He left it laying on the stand when he sat down. <laughs> and when Brother Porter got up, he took that nice red apple and he said, now my friend said that before the world began that God determined that he was going to eat this apple. He took a bite out of it. <laughs> he cheated and swallowed a little bit. He said, and he kept repeating what the man had said. 
And there was some other stuff too, doesn't matter that happened, but he ate it right down to the core and left the core sitting on the stand there. Well, that was a humorous, that was a humorous thing that took place. But it made a point, and every time you think about that point, it, it, it sticks in your mind that circumstances alter cases. You talk about immutable decrees of God. Circumstances, God allows circumstances to unfold for things to occur. So parable did that. It congealed the truth. It, it gave it a permanent shape or mold. Put it in that form so you could get the lesson that he had in fact. There's another purpose of the parable. And that was that the parable was intended to cause people to recognize the principle of truth even before he, he realized the application of it to himself. A classic example of that is David and Nathan. Remember after David sinned with Bathsheba, Nathan the prophet came to him and he told something. He, told, he really told the parable. David took it to be a fact. He thought it was a real situation because it was so typical in real life. Anybody remember what the story was he told him? Yeah, there was a rich man and a poor man in the story. Poor man, the rich man had many flocks and herds. What did the poor man have? One, one lamb. One ewe lamb. It was a pet. He'd, he'd pet it, hold it to his bosom. And so the rich man had company to come, and he, instead of killing one of the many animals that he had, which had been no sacrifice for him, he went and took that poor, that poor man's lamb and killed it and dressed it and made a feast for his friend. And Nathan's question was, what should I, what ought to happen to a fellow? Like, what did David say? What? He ought to, he ought to be put to death anybody do the things that can. And he ought to have to pay four times the price of that land. What is worth? What did Nathan say to him? Thou art the man. Thou art the man. David had climbed out on a limb, and Nathan sawed it off. And it was too late to get back to the tree. He couldn't get back. See, see, but it was a parable that brought David to repentance. David said, what? I have a sin. Pray to the Lord for me. And so it was a parable then that, that caused him to recognize this principle of truth, even before he could see that that applied to him. Now let's get back to this parable. They said, what, what does it mean? Here, the sorrow goes out to sow, you see, and it falls into different kinds of ground. Well, that's a typical ordinary thing. You know, you ever had a garden or raised on a farm, you know about sowing seed, different kinds of soil. All the soil is not the same. And hearts are not the same piece. We're talking here about hearts. He said, the sower goes out to sow. Now, the point of the parable is not about the sower. Now, Luke's, uh, or Mark said, the sower is the one who teaches the word of God. And there are passages, a number of passages in the Bible that deal with the sower. Can you think of some about books in the Bible that would deal with the sower of the seed? Not everybody wants them. <laughs> what books would deal with it? Well, someone who goes out and preaches the gospel. Paul with three journeys. Paul? Paul with three journeys of Acts. Three. Oh, the journeys of Paul? What about, yeah, those Timothy. Six. Timothy. What? Timothy. First and second Timothy. What else? Titus. There's an evangelist. Much of second Corinthians deals with it. And a, and a good bit of first Thessalonians does, actually. <laughs> Second chapter in particular of uh, First Thessalonians. This deals with the sower, and sometimes God places emphasis on that. that the importance of a man uh, practicing what he preaches. Paul told him to take heed to yourself after the doctrine. And uh, the importance of teaching the word. Don't, he said, preach the word, the instant in season and after, you know how that goes. So there are passages that emphasize the sower. He's mentioned here in this parable, but he's not the point of it. Then the seed. He sows the seed. Well, what is the seed? He said in Luke 8, verse 11, the seed is the word of God. 
And that's an important point to make, but it's not the point of this parable. There are other passages that deal with the importance of that, teaching the Word of God without, some, uh, without addition or subtraction or rearrangement. Speak it boldly, plainly, so everybody can understand it. But that's still not the point of the parable. The point of the parable is the soil, the ground, in which it falls. And that's why it has different results. Because the ground's different. And he goes on to make, make the point here about what, these, what, what this ground is. He said, he that so let's, let's go back to the parable now. In verse 11, he said, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The word of God's going to be preached now. Well, what, what happens to it? He said, those by the wayside are they that hear. <clears throat> then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. <coughs> Here is the wayside soil. You go out and sow seed, and some of it falls in the, in the hearts of the heart. The wayside soil is, is where the path is, falls alongside the field, and it's hard, it's crusty. And if you just drop some seed on top of it, what's going to happen? Well, it can't get it, it can't penetrate, it can't put down any roots. And before any of that can happen, what happens to the seed? Goes away. The birds have their death and they come need it. And there are people like that. There are people who come to hear the gospel. Maybe they come with a relative. Please a wife or please a, a child or some kin folks or some friend that you sort of have an obligation to it, so you come with them. Uh, you just stumble in, you know, and you don't intend to learn anything. You're just there. And so you hear the, you hear the word preached, and to you, to, to a person like that, it's just dead, dull, and dry. It doesn't mean anything. Just an exercise in futility. The word of God falls on, on hearts like that. The stone. Do you think we have any hearts like that in the world today? No. Are there are there people in the world still today that the word of God's not of any interest to? How, how big a crowd do we have here today? Well, we've got a pretty good number. Are there places around that have a bigger crowd than this? Yeah. What about the race in Charlotte? <laughs> Be a, be a few more folks there, you suppose? What about the football games on Sunday? The stadiums are packed with people. You think they're you think they have any interest, particularly in the word of God? Not on that occasion. It's not what that's about. College college football stadiums are all full, they just pack the can and it costs a lot of money to get there. The Word of God falls on hearts that are like, like the wayside soil. It doesn't penetrate. And we preach and preach and preach to people like that, and it, it, it doesn't, doesn't go anywhere. I worked for a while in, in, in Norway, in Scandinavia. And that's a hard field. There's a lot of wayside soil over there. There are people who have no spiritual interest whatever. And you have to struggle and struggle to try to. We worked for two years over there and baptized six people. We had to start from scratch, but uh, it, it was hard work because you've got a lot of wayside ground. But now, that's not all of it. He said, they which fell on, that which fell on rocky soil, verse 13, they on the rock are they, which when they hear, Receive the word with joy, but these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. Now, rocky soil, what kind of ground is that? Have you ever tried to plant anything in rocky, rocky soil? <clears throat> Our house is built on a ledge that's a lot of clay for a little while, and right down into that it rock. And we've had, a, we've had several shrubs to die. And the reason is that the root problem, there's a root problem. 
rocky ground. You plant something and it springs up. It comes up all right. It looks good. But when the sun comes up, don't get enough rain. Can't get that root system down underneath there. And it will die. When the word of God falls in a heart like that, he said there are people who hear it and receive it with joy. I've seen people obey the gospel in meetings and they come down the aisle with tears streaming down their cheeks. And it's obvious that they really mean it. They're sincere about it. And they do believe for a while. Sometimes I can think that you, some people say you can't, that a believer can't fall away. Uh, this passage is in the way of that idea because it says, for a while they do believe. They do believe. But in time of temptation, they fall away. I wonder how many people live in this area down here, Hickory, Newton, this general area, that at one time or another have heard the gospel and obeyed it and have fallen away. You ever there any? You suppose you could, you could find some if you, if you search hard enough who learned the truth, heard it, fall away. Why? It's rocky ground, rocky soil. It's a condition of the heart. God's spoken, but they're not listening anymore. Or stop listening. Then he talked about a third kind of ground. He talked about the, the seed falling in, in, in a third kind of soil. Look, look at verse 14. They which fell among the thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Here are people now who hear the word they receive and it grows up. Your seed makes a plant. But weeds grow up. What happens if you have a garden, you know, if you don't keep the grass out of it, what happens to it? It's your crop of weeds. <laughs> you have a nice crop of weeds. That's right. Well, what kind of, if, if, if the tomato plant grows up in the middle of that, you might, might have some tomatoes, but will they get very big? The weeds take the nutrients away. Yeah, the, 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 that's right. The, the weeds take some of the nutrients that the plant root, root system needs and deprives it of it. They're choked. They're choked out. Now, he said their heart's like that. Now, you may think, well, this lesson doesn't, doesn't much apply to me. Now, if you thought that, I want to tell you, your time has come right now. And my time, too. This is one of the areas where we're hurting as God's people. The Word of God is being choked out of the lives and hearts of many of us with the very things Jesus talked about, with the cares, the riches, and the pleasures of this life. You think that applies to any of us? <clears throat> Let's talk about it. The cares of this life. How does that show the word of What are cares in this? What are, what are name some cares? Money. Money? Well, we'll get the riches in a little while, but uh, that's, that's one care. What? Safety and security. Security? People buy security, uh, security systems for their houses. Then forget the password or whatever. <laughs> you have to call the fire department or the police or something to get your house. Um, what? Maybe some more cares. Yeah. What? Family. Family? Oh my. Anything to take us away from from what we should do. Yeah. Any, any other thing that we want to put God on the first. All right. Any of you ever raised children? <laughs> are they cares? <laughs> they are. They are. They start growing up, and it's, I remember when my, my boys were growing up, it, it got to the place where it cost more to buy them a pair of shoes than it did to buy me a suit. It's a care. My oldest boy is six, six, four and a half. And uh, when he got to be about 15 years old, every time I looked at him, it seemed like his, the bottom of his jeans was about that high above his ankle. 
You ever bought the jeans lately? <laughs> That's care. Did you ever go out in the morning to go to work and you keep that key in the ignition and you turn it and nothing happens? Not even one, not even a sound. What's the problem? Got a dead battery. And you think to yourself, what in the world? What? This is all I need right now. Running late anyway. That's a care. It ends. One time, I remember in the middle of the night, I heard a horrendous noise in the kitchen. I went in, we went to London and see what, where it was. Our faithful refrigerator that served us about 15 years died at that time. <laughs> And if somebody had told me when we went to bed that we'd have a, a new refrigerator in the kitchen on, and have a pavement to make on it <laughs> by the next night, I wouldn't believe it. But, that, but that's life. That goes on. That's a care. The things that happen in life. Your, your kids come home to the dentist, and guess what they got to do? Braces. Braces. <laughs> you think for any of that money? No. <laughs> things are care. And they're typical of life. No wonder when Jesus talked about this. We said a while ago, these were slices of real life that he's talking about here. And yet, these are things we have to attend to. You say, well, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to tend to them. But what's the problem? Let them what? Let them consume us or take our focus. All right. It, it diverts our focus. Yes. It, it, it keeps us from attending to things. That are, that are really more important in, in life. If we, if their kids got to be raised, yes. They got to have clothes, yes. We got to put a battery in the car, we will start, yes. We got to do all of that. But in the process of doing all that, we've got to keep our we got to keep our mind centered on who we are and what we are and what we're here for. Don't let these cares inundate you to the point that you can't remember what your responsibility to the Lord is. God has spoken. You listening? Then he said the cares and riches of this life. You, uh, you expect me to ever be rich? Anybody here expect to be rich? Not in this life. Not in this life? <laughs> Would you be surprised if I told you that you are rich? How many cars do you have at your house? <laughs> How many people in the world have a goat cart instead of a house? Or not, not even a cart? They never expect to own an automobile. You got one? One cart? You have two? Three? How many? Yeah. Do you have a TV at your house? How many? <laughs> That's your house. Do you have a microwave? Do you have a computer? Do you have a cell phone? Everybody, everybody's got to have one. These everybody goes around one is hanging up here all the time. I, you know, I never understood, Stan, what the obsession is about having to be continually in touch with somebody. There are times that I don't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> I don't want to be let alone. I don't care what time you went to bed or what you ate when you went to crack barrel. <laughs> the granddaughter was on Facebook. She said, well, I'm tired of going to bed. 500,000 people have access to the fact that she's tired she's going to bed. Who cares? <laughs> But riches, things that money buys. I can take you to places in this world where I can show you some poor folks if you don't know where you don't know any. There are people all over this world who get anything in that they that they have opportunity to give to trade places with you. With you. Let's talk about what Paul said about riches though. Let's turn to first Timothy six a minute. We're going to come back to Luke 6, to Luke 8, so keep your place there. But 1 Timothy 6. Paul talked about, about material things and the attitude that we ought to have toward them. Let's see that. 
That's a classic here, quite a good one. This is good. First Timothy chapter 6. And let's start down about verse 6. He said, That's okay. He didn't take that Lisa Marie airplane or the Stutch Bear Cat automobile or the gold Cadillac or the gold of the platinum records and all the fancy regalia that he wore in his performances. None of that. He said, we brought nothing into this world. And it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Let's read over what he said. Verse 5, having food and rain. What's rain? Clothing. Clothes. Having food and clothing. Let us be there with contempt. Now look at verse 9. But they that will be rich. Focus on will be. They that will be rich. This speaks of, of, of ambition, aspiration. I'm going to be, I'm going to make it. I'm going to get my slice of the pie. They that will be rich <coughs> fall into temptation. And the snare, what's a snare? Trap. It's a trap. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and this. Tell me, folks, what is the temptation that you fall into when you when you have a have a driving ambition that I'm going to get rich? What what's the temptation that, that exposes you to? You become blind to everything. What? You become blind to everything else. All right, you blinded everything else. What else? Huh? Greed. Greed sets in if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit more money. Somebody, Somebody asked. 
Somebody asked Johnny Rockefeller that one time, said, how much money do you want? He said, just a little more. <laughs> Remember what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 5? He said, they that love silver shall not be satisfied with silver. They gotta have a little more. And something else. We've, we've known a few folks through the years. I don't, you know, we don't run around hot um, too much with, with the very rich. But I've known a few, I've known a few folks in my lifetime who were pretty well off. And uh, we had a friend who was, he and his brother in the printing business, and they'd done very well. They had, they had uh, prospered greatly in their work. And uh, he told me one time, he said, you know, Connie, he said, I have a real problem trying to, to decide who my real friends are. Mm -hmm. He said, it's hard for me to distinguish between who's really a friend and who's just trying to get his hand in my pocket to get some of my money. That's a problem I don't have to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> but he did. He did. They that will be rich fall into temptation, trap, snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men. Howard Hughes said one time, every man has his price. Do you believe that? Are you that cynical? I'm not. I believe that there are still some people in the world who, who live on principle, not price, and who cannot be bought. There are people who can be bought, but there are people who can't be either. And I'm glad for that. Paul couldn't be bought. Stan was drilling the little kids down here this morning. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego couldn't be bought. Daniel couldn't be bought. There are people who, who have principles, and they, they, they're not going to settle down. And we need to be in that number, all of us. Look at the rest of us, he said. Verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, he didn't say money is the root of all evil. He said the what? The love of it. You know, money doesn't have any character. It takes the character of whoever owns it. You have money in your pocket. It takes on the character of the, of the owner of that money. You can take a hundred dollars and you can bet it on the horses. Or you can take a hundred dollars and you can buy a really good Bible and have money left over to buy, uh, to buy a, a concordance so you know how to find every word in it you want to find. And maybe enough money to buy you a good Bible uh, geography book so you can find out where the Jordan River went. Tools that will help you to study about it. Money doesn't have any character. Abraham was a rich man. Job was rich. The Bible says he was. It's not wrong to be rich. It's not wrong to prosper in this life. But there are dangers involved in it. And we need to be aware of those. Jesus said, when the seed fall into that thorny ground, the thorns grow up, choke it, and it bears no fruit to perfection. And so he said, the love of money is the root of all evil or all kinds of evil, which while some coveted after they have earned from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And I'm sad to report to you that I've lived long enough to know some brethren who have fallen in love with money, what money will buy, and in the bargain have lost their souls. They have heard from the faith. God has spoken. You listening? Let's go back. Go back to Luke, the eighth chapter. He said, That which fell among the thorns of they which have heard, they go forth and are choked with cares and riches, 
and pleasures of this life. Pleasures of this life. Did you ever miss the Lord's Day worship <coughs> for a family reunion? <clears throat> Did you ever miss the worship for a ball game? Do you reckon anybody ever does it? Is it wrong to go fishing? I hope not. <laughs> but I'll tell you what is wrong. That's to get up on Sunday morning, hitch your boat up behind your truck, and head off to the lake and forget all about your appointment with God, with God's people. And you abandon the assembly of God's people for your pleasure. Anybody ever do that? <coughs> well, I'm trying to know that that's true, that people do that sometimes. <coughs> Pleasures of this life. We get our children, we get up a certain age, and we can't wait to get a little league, on a little league ball team. There's anything wrong with that, not that I know of. But I'll tell you what, there's some dangers involved. And the danger is that you may teach your child that it's more important to go to a ball game or a practice for a ball game on Wednesday night than to go to a and what the lesson you teach them is that ball games are more important than church service. That's the, that's the lesson. That's the lesson they get. So you need to make some arrangement if they're going to do that. Have it understood with coaches that when it comes time to go to church service, they've got to come out. I remember one time Wilson, the oldest boy was a little league team, and we had it understood with the coach that they could practice and or play it except when it got conflict with church service. And if it did, they had to come out by 7 o'clock. We'd need to, we'd need to go to the game with a towel and a washcloth and a bar of soap to try to clean it up a little bit before we got them to service. But they had to come out by 7 o'clock. But he got a double, and he was asked out. He was so proud of himself standing out on the second base, and it was 7 o'clock. And I went to the dugout, and I said, Coach, he's got to come out here. We've got to go. We've got a Bible study tonight. He said, well, can't you wait until this inning's over? And I said, Coach, do you know how long an inning can last a little people? <laughs> he said, I, okay. So he put a runner in front of him, and he came. He didn't, he didn't want to come out. But he did. Because ball games are not as important as church services. And we need to teach that to our children. We just need to drill that into them over and over again. That's, that's important, but it's not as important as this other thing. You, you get the fifth of what Jesus is talking about here? The word falls into the heart, and it grows, but the other thing to grow up with it is sap the strength and the energy out of it, and our attention is diverted to what it ought to be. Pleasures of this life. You remember what it said about Moses in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, verses 24 and 5? Moses made a choice. Anybody remember what it was? What did he choose? He chose to suffer affliction for the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season or for a time. He recognized that pleasure is a fleeting thing. Well, the old Greek philosopher said, pleasure is like a leaky bucket. Do you fill it up and it runs out? And you have to fill it up again. Is there, is there a place for pleasure in this life? Yes. Sometimes people think that the preachers are just been on trying to keep everybody from having fun. No, that's not what we're about at all. Life, life needs to be enjoyable. Life ought to be pleasurable for us. It's got to be. God's people ought to be the happiest people on the face of the earth. But there are choices that we have to make, and choices have consequences. And there are priorities that we have to set. So Jesus said that the word falls into, into ground here, but it's, it's thorny ground. Weeds grow up with it, choke the word, it doesn't bring any fruit to perfection. It may have some old naughty fruit on it, but it won't be as perfect as it ought to be. Now, look at the rest of it. Verse 15. 
they that put that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart. Oh, now this is what this is all about. Hearts. In an honest and good heart, having heard the word, God spoke it. Keep it. And bring forth fruit with patience. In Matthew's account of it, and Mark's account of it, he said, some bring forth thirtyfold, some sixty, and some hundredfold. And what that says is we don't all have the same capabilities. There's some of us that can only produce thirtyfold, some of us sixty, some can produce a hundredfold. What does God hold you accountable for? Huh? For what you can do, right? Does God hold you accountable for what Stan does? Stan, you got to hold you accountable for what he can do. No, sir. We all have different capacities, different capabilities. And so God holds us answerable for what we're able to do. So we need to bear fruit in the service of the Lord. So God's spoken all right. We need to hear what he had to say. Jesus said in this passage over and over again, take heed how you hear. Or we give an answer as to how we heard. Well, what do you want to say about this passage? What, what applications could you make? Could you make with this passage with jobs? With jobs? <laughs> Yeah, that, that could be that could be one of these thorns, couldn't it? That chokes it out. We've got to have jobs on it. Make a living. Should you make a commitment for a job that obligates you where you can never meet the worship of God's people? You need a job like that? Well, that job's kind of hard to come by sometimes. They are. Certain times they are. And we need jobs. We need to be able to provide for our families. But while we're trying to provide a living, we must not neglect to make a life. That matters. What application would you make of that? What's necessary? Like the overtimes and the things like that. Yeah. There may be times when you're, you're when you have an obligation that you that it's not your choice. You don't have any control over. I can imagine military service and he's off on the back side of the world in a situation that he can't get out of. He's got obligations he's got to take care of. But to knowingly and deliberately enter into a situation where you know that either you're not going to be able to worship the Lord or your job is going to require you to do something that would be a violation of the will of God. Would you need a job like that? Would you take a job like that? Would you lie for your boss? You're working in an office and the telephone rings and the boss says, Please, so and so, tell him I'm in a meeting. I'm not available. Would you lie for your boss? Would you? Cut corners. These are these are pertinent. These are questions deal with real life, aren't they? We talk. We said parables or slices of real life. We're talking about real life here. Well, I hope that the things we've talked about here today will be useful to us, and cause us all to think about our responsibilities to the Lord, and listening to what He said, and keeping it. And not just keeping it, but doing it, practicing it for life. Paul wrote to the Philippians in the fourth chapter, verse 9, he said, The things that you've heard of me among many witnesses. Well, that's what Paul said to me. He said, The things that you have learned from me, I want you to do. Whether you've learned it from my preaching or from writing, from my example, he said, These things do. God so that's the best point of this lesson today. Thank you very much for listening. Sam said I had 
I'd be good at four to two. I'm going to give you back a little time. You don't take that snow. <laughs> but anyway, I've done it. I always thought the beginning was quick, so I've done it. <laughs>